Hey, sports fans, Larry with Katie Nagio. Katie, am I pronouncing your last name correctly? It, close. It's Najat. Najat. So, Najat. So, Katie Back. Najat. She's a Nike sponsor pole vaulter. She's got a, a PB of 491 indoors and 492 outdoors, which is screaming. You know, it's uh, for people who screwed up in math in high school in the U.S., that's over 16 feet. It's like uh, 492 is about 16, two and a half. And four nine one and some change. I don't okay. know what the change. I, I, okay, we'll be total <laughs> respect of that. Um, it's great to finally uh, talk to you. I have seen yeah. you all over the place, and thank you for taking some time with us. Um, of course. So, uh, the, the first thing I find about you in the pole vault was from 2013. Okay. When did you start vaulting? I started back in 2004. Um, I was 13 years old. Wow. But that was just, I mean, very beginners. And uh -huh. 2013 was when I graduated college, kind of had jumped at U.S. Nationals. So that was kind of, I guess, my breakout. But I was I was holding my own and doing okay. But it, it wasn't until 2018 that I really had my big year. So NCAA champion, correct? Yes. Okay. You too. Now, what, what was your uh, D2? What school did you go to? Uh, I... Went to Dayton, the University of Dayton for the first two years, and then I transferred to Ashland University. Um, so I was D1 at Dayton and then transferred to Ashland, which is D2. What did you like about D2? Um, I really loved, I had put so much pressure on myself in D1. Mm -hmm. um, and some, some of it was just, a lot of it was unnecessary. I just overwhelmed myself. But it's D1. It's the highest level and you want to do well for your coaches and your team and everything. And so going to D2, it's just a little more laid back, but it helped me find my internal motivation. And just, it really helped me to say, I want to be here for me. Like I, there, there's not that there's pressure. Of course you want yeah. to do well for all those things that I said before, but it just, it allowed me to find that internal motivation so uh athletes have what you call like those perfect days right <laughs> yeah. and in 2018 you had one of those at the u.s indoor champs um yeah. <laughs> tell us a little i mean i i remember sitting there because i was at um a table and i was directly across from you and i'm watching and i'm just going okay wow <laughs> she she's just screaming what how's everybody else gonna respond you just had that perfect competition. What was it about that? I, going into that competition, I knew I was going to have a good day. I was ready. We had been practicing really well. I had been attempting 480 bars, and I knew I was ready to have a really big meet. I also knew that I was ranked third, and so I had to be top two to make that team. I knew that I was very capable of jumping high, and I, I think I said to my mom, you know, if somebody else beats me, good on them, but they're going to have to work really hard to do it. I just feel really good about this meet. And yeah, we just, I was really dialed in and the whole meet, I only focused on two cues the whole time. And it mm. just, I, the weekend before I had no heighted, um, it, it was UW at UW and I knew it was going to be a very similar setup. And the reason I know heighted was I just blew through all my poles really quickly. Uh -huh. So I didn't get to the pole that I needed to in warm ups. And so going to Albuquerque, it's also a really fast raised runway where notoriously you're on your biggest poles. And I think had I not had that happen the weekend before, I wouldn't have pushed poles and warm ups the way that I did in Albuquerque, which I was only on two poles the entire competition because I pushed myself in warm up to get to the biggest pole I could. I was on that pole up through 476 and then we just went up one pole and that was what I was on the rest of the day. So it was kind of the perfect storm of things. Sure, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, who is your coach? Brad Walker. Oh, wow, okay, God, I've got great pictures of Brad from <laughs> the, old, the old and golden days. So oh, gosh, yeah. how is he as a coach? Is he, um, like real demonstrative? Is he real detail oriented? How would you describe that, that relationship? It's, he's 
I, arguably the best coach I've ever had. And I've had uh -huh. great coaches. So that's not a reflection of my other coaches. It's just, he's that good. Um, he's tough, but he's not mean. If I get yelled at, I cry. So yeah. I'm just so hard on myself that yeah. starting to get frustrated. And then you yell at me on top of that. I just turn to a mess. So he's really good at keeping the emotions away for me. It's all my biggest weakness has always been my mental game. Um, I've always been kind of afraid to pole vault. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's just been something that's always made me anxious, but I love mm -hmm. it. I love that it challenges me and I love how I feel when I conquer that. But he has, when I came to him, he really tackled the mental side of it and just how to focus on the runway and trying to execute something every time before I would just run down throw my hands up, kind of hope for the best. And that's a scary way to do it with what we do. Yeah, yeah. And so he was able to help change my mindset to focusing on these cues, things to execute in the jump so that, that it keeps the emotion out of it. When you're focused on doing something specific as you're running down, it's much less, you know, anxious, anxiety inducing. So um, that was the biggest thing and the first thing. And then once we were able to to kind of conquer that. And it's, I mean, it's not a hundred percent. I think it's something I'm always going to have there that I just need to be conscious of. And, and, but he's, he gave me the tools to keep that at bay so that we could really tackle the technical things and just running through that takeoff aggressively. I had a tendency to kind of lean back, slow down and that's losing energy. So sure. um, that was kind of, I would say those are the two main things cool. and there's been a lot of little things, but yeah. When you, um, since you really got up there in 2018, every time you compete, you're competing against, well, in the championships, you're competing against two Americans, Jen Schur and Sandy Morris. And, you know, they've got between them a, a ton of accolades and a ton of big jumps. Um, how do you, how do you deal with that? Is that stuff that you and Brad talk about in, and are, do you say, okay, look, we're here we're going to compete. I'm going to, I'm just, I'm going to do the best I can. Yeah. It goes back to those cues and the execution points, because if you do, you know, two plus two equals four, if I focus on this and this, then the heights come. Mm -hmm. And so we, I'm always trying to do these things in the jump and execute things in the jump a very specific way. And I, I train like that. And then when I get to a meet, I focus that same way and it just keeps that emotion of, oh, she's here, oh, she's here, oh, she's having a good day, just out of it. Because at the at that meet in 2018, um, they were having great days. It was really, it was very competitive. But I, I just focused on those two things, and and the rest kind of fell into place. So, yeah, it's less about oh, what everybody else is doing, and just if you focus and on those things that you can control and those those cues the rest kind of falls into place. So. Uh, talk to us about 2020. Uh, been a strange year. Yeah. Um, when did you know that your year was going to be affected by COVID? I think we all started to worry uh, probably around, I don't know when it was announced, but probably around February to March is when it started to kind of be like, oh, shoot, this could be a real thing. And then it was announced that the Olympics was going to be postponed. And I always thought that if that would happen, I would just be crushed and devastated. Mm -hmm. And I was disappointed, do not get me wrong. But it was one of those things where I looked at it as, okay, like that it, it sucks, but I get it. And yeah. there are still things that I can control. I can control how I train. I can, you know, there's still... I don't know if we'll get to compete, but I want to train as if we will. And in doing that, I was able to then set a new personal best, even just at small local meets. So that it was weird and elements of it were definitely frustrating, but overall it worked, it worked in my favor because I was able to practice and just train and we're still working on things technically that can make me better. And we were able to really work on a lot of that. When I, when I go to a competition, a lot of pole vaulters, they'll revert in their technique. 
Okay. And okay. so it gave us nothing but time to yeah. get rid of a lot of those bad habits. So what was your indoor season like in 2020? I originally wasn't sure I was even going to do an indoor season because 2019 went so late mm -hmm. that we kind of said, okay, if we compete at all indoors, it'll be from short approach, maybe just go for, because at that point there was an indoor world. So just not rush it, but then go to USA's and say, you know, things go well, you make the world team. And, but if not, the Olympics is the focus. And we didn't want to rush my indoor season preseason training mm -hmm. to go to go for indoors when the Olympics is, is what matters most. So I competed twice once at the Reno pole vault summit and just from short approach. And then again, at a local meet in Atlanta at the Atlanta track club, um, again, from short approach. And then I rolled my ankle and was out for the rest of that. That just kind of decided that, yeah. um, we were debating going to, um, to USA's, but that kind of decided that. And then obviously outdoors hit and it was just a little crazy. So the, um, did you do the ultimate garden? Yes, I did. Tell yeah. us about that one because that was kind of, I enjoyed watching that. <laughs> that was honestly the hardest thing I've ever done pole vaulting wise because mm -hmm. I am not an endurance athlete. I really struggle with endurance type workouts. That's why I'm a pole vaulter. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was the most challenging thing I've ever done. And it, I, it was the most rewarding thing as well, because knowing that I could push through that feeling uh -huh. exhausted as I did, because doing a jump a minute is, it doesn't sound that bad, but you get to like four or five and you're like, crap, like this is our, and then you have, I was, I, my goal was just get a jump per minute. Mm -hmm. And so you, I, it's a lot, it's a lot. And I was exhausted, but it was so much fun. Yeah. At the reward from it, I learned a lot about myself. And you learn, even when you're tired, you can still make think your body can do more than you think it can. And that really helped at some of the outdoor meets. There were there was one in particular where I was just absolutely exhausted. I had no idea why, but from beginning to end, I felt terrible. But having done that. It helped me to stay relaxed and just say, look, your body will do just, it will do what you're asking it to do. Mm -hmm. Just stay calm and, and hit the cue. So if you weren't a pole vaulter, what event in track and field would you do? Well, let me ask you this. Would it be what I wish I was good at or what I am good what, at? What you wish you were good at. Oh, that's hard. Um, I have so much respect for like mid distance runners that where it's kind of a sprint and endurance as well. So I've always really liked the 800 and cool. 1500. I really enjoyed watching those. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd probably say that if I had an ounce of endurance, I would <laughs> it was really fun, but. Do you listen to music while you work out? Yes. Yeah. What do you, what's your favorite? What's on your, uh, your list? We tend to play. I would say like '90s kind of hip hop, like. Oh, uh, really? Cool. Okay. Nelly radio, like that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> songs that yeah. you hear and you're like, I forgot about this one. It's so yeah. good. And you can dance to it. It puts you in a good mood. But coach doesn't want to turn it off because it's not too vulgar. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. So I we we tend to play some different things, but I we consistently go back to that, and it just keeps it fun. What activities do you do when you're not vaulting? Is there things you, what, what kind of gives you a release? What allows you to relax? I love Netflix. Like I love watching TV and just sitting on my couch and just totally relaxing. Um, I love, love going out to eat and trying new foods um, mm -hmm. on the weekends when I don't compete. That's something I like to usually do is, you know, go out to dinner with good friends, good food, have a drink, like mm -hmm. things like that. Um, yeah, I'd say those are kind of the the main relaxing ones mentally and physically and shopping. I mean, retail therapy always gets me. Okay, happy. your top two shows on Netflix. What have you loved the most? What what you, what would you recommend to people right now? Well, right now, I really liked that show Bridgerton. 
That's the new Yeah, one. okay. I, that's what's on our list right now. Okay, it's, okay. It's good. It's very entertaining. You can't mm-hmm. you can't go in thinking it's going to be realistic in any sense. Mm-hmm. It's very fantasized, but it's it's fun. Mm-hmm. I really okay. Um I also I really like true crime like documentaries and things like that. So anytime yeah. it comes out with a new one, um that's kind of top of my list. So cool. I really like watching Law and Order SVU. It's probably Yeah. Yeah, Law and Order. That's that, that, <laughs> yeah. Those are the big ones. Those are the big ones. Um, you were talking about doing some travel this season, and yeah. it sounds like, and I just was grabbing some social media before I went on, that yeah. you're not going to go to Europe. So you want to tell us a little bit what's going on? Yes. So uh, early December, I tested positive for COVID, okay. and I was pretty sick from that. Um, not miserably sick. I wasn't in the hospital, but mm. I it, it knocked me out. Um, and I'm now in this 90 day window where I can continue to test positive, even if I'm not, you know, contagious, I'm not sick, sick. Mm. Um, and going to Europe would require a lot of COVID tests, which yeah. rightfully so. And naively I was like, I'm just going to bring my first COVID test and a doctor's note and it'll be fine. And the more I thought about it and the more USATF you know, medical staff I talked to, I'm like, this is the French border control. They're not going to listen to a doctor's note. So it, it just made sense. The last thing I want is to have to quarantine in a hotel in France for two weeks when I'm not sick. Uh, You know, I've already missed a lot of training and the last thing I need right now is to do that for my physical and mental well-being. I think so. How are you feeling? I'm good. I will say I'm finally physically back to where I I was before, Mm -hmm. but it took, it took some time. That's the thing I noticed the most was while I was sick, felt like, like a bad cold. Um, I I mean, I was definitely sick and tired and congestion was like the biggest thing, which I had a pretty bad headache. And I think my, it was just so deeply congested that I had Mm -hmm. a headache. Um, and body aches. So that, that, that only lasted for a couple days where I was just laying on my couch or in my room really, because yeah, I have a roommate. So I did quarantine up in my room, um, just not feeling well and just not wanting to get off my couch. But after a couple days, most of it subsided. I did lose my taste and smell, which was frustrating because as I said, I love to go out and eat and try new food, whatever. And so that was, that was not fun. Just laying in bed and eating things that I couldn't mm-hmm. taste. It's, it's yeah. a weird, weird sensation. Um, but after about 10 days, I would say I, I felt relatively normal just walking around. And, and um, so I got my heart checked just to be sure that everything was good and fine there because we, I've heard that some athletes are experiencing heart problems after COVID. And mm-hmm. with my family history, my dad passed away of a heart attack when I was 16. I just did not want to mess with it. Yeah. So yeah. I got that checked out, did a full workup and that's all good. good, um, good. But getting back to training, the power output, the mind body connection, that's the biggest thing I've noticed different than any other sickness I've experienced coming back was weird for me. (laughs) It was, everything was off. And I know every, every person experiences it differently. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm not saying that that is what's going to happen if you get it, but it was, it was tough for a bit there because as an athlete, once you're healthy, you want to be back to hundred percent. And so getting back on the runway and feeling like I had no power in my first couple steps and, as I'm coming down the runway into the takeoff, it it was happening so fast because as I got going, I did start bringing some speed, but the mind body connection, I, I just couldn't process it to move my hands. And so it was, it was tough. Um, but I will say I am this week, especially physically, I'm feeling pretty good. I, I maxed out in some of my lifts. So I think good, that, good. that goes to show it's, it's coming back. I'm not a lost cause by any means, but it's just frustrating when you're at this level, you want to be at your best all the time. And sure. I just have to tell myself you got sick and, and it sucks, but it, this is, you just got to stay patient with yourself. Will you compete in the U S during the indoor season? Yes, I'm definitely 
I'm planning to, we don't have like a set schedule yet. I am planning to go to Arkansas this weekend. So that's, Good. that's plan. Um, well, so, that'd be yeah. awesome. I'm, I'm excited. I have zero expectations for myself. It's going to be interesting. I, there's a good chance I'll compete from short. I'm not, not really sure yet. We're going to vault tomorrow mm -hmm. and just see how that goes and make some decisions after that. But it's, yeah, it'll, I'm, I'm happy to get back to it and start to feel a little normal again. In talking to elite athletes, one of the questions I like to ask him is um, how, I've heard that when you have a perfect jump or a perfect run or a perfect throw, it's almost effortless. And when I talked to Ryan Krauser, I, I said, Ryan, when do you know you're going to have like a 22 eight man, you know, and he goes, when I complete the release, when do you know in, when you're vaulting that it's a big one? I would say as I'm running down, I can feel my posture and I know if I'm going to hit it well. It's a little bit trickier in vaulting because sometimes as you're feeling fantastic, you actually, you run better and you just end up blowing through. And so mm -hmm. your best jump, you just might not be on the right pole. So it gets a little bit trickier, but I will say for us, you, you know, in the last few steps, like going into the takeoff and, and in that first kind of jump into the takeoff, if things are going to, be good <laughs> so say, say i'm watching you jump you're at 481 okay mm -hmm. and i'm watching from the side and i see you and i'm going oh my god she's like 12 centimeters over you know 41 does that um can you sense that when you had just a rock and clearance when it's just everything's going well okay and, and now, sometimes it's harder to get as pole vaulters, we've gotten really good at, at knowing what things feel like. So oftentimes we know, okay, this is when it's time to go up a pole. I don't need to go up a pole. I just need to stay back better. But sometimes we do need that video analysis and our coach to be like, actually, you felt this, but this is actually what it looks like on camera. So we're going to do this. I was in uh, Madrid in 2019. I went to the whole uh, World Indoor Tour. Nice. And I'm sitting in the stands with the Russian and Cuban coaches, okay, which I love to do. Um, and because I want to watch them interact with their athletes, right? And I'm watching Sidorova's coach with her and just the communication. And it, it was like, it reminded me of watching Isambayeva with her two coaches back in the old days, right? But Sidorova doesn't like miss anything. Um, how do you compete? You're competing with an athlete like that. How do you compete with athletes like that? You just, like I said before, you make it about your jump and the cues and mm -hmm. it's really just you and the bar. So if you're executing your jump, the bar will stay. If you, what we do and the way we approach it is in warmups, get to your biggest pole that you possibly can. A lot of people go into the warmups like, oh, just, just get comfortable. Like, but our logic for doing that and getting to the biggest pole that you can that day. And the way that we gauge that is the bungees up around a PR and I'm just kind of skimming it on the backside with the standards buried. So when the, when the bar goes up and it's significantly lower than your personal best, either with the standards all the way back, you either blow through in which you know you have to go up a pole. There's really no other option because the standards are all the way back or you clear it by a lot and then you keep going up. So it just minimizes the variables. And by doing that, it sets you up pretty nicely to then for the rest of the meet, you know, you, you're not really thinking about what the other vaulters are doing because as you're running down, your focus is just so dialed into what you want to do or at least me, I guess, I guess I can't speak for anybody else, but as I'm coming in, it's after my first few steps, I just, I just let my body go and then focus on, okay, really executing those couple things at the takeoff that I know will lend to making bars. So why is the women's pole vault so popular? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> That's the attitude. I think right now it's really exciting because there are so, so many women 
that are capable of winning on any given day. Mm -hmm. And there are several women that are in the realm of breaking the world record. Um, I think it's really exciting right now. And I mean, yeah, I think That's we're cool. fun to watch. <laughs> um, you, uh, po pole vaulters compete. I mean, I, Boop could competed until his late thirties. Yes. Um, and I've seen some of the French guys compete until their forties, you know, and Renault's never going to retire. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> I hope not. He's so yeah, good. He, he's a lot of fun. He just, the first time I interviewed him, he did it, made me ask him questions in French and my French is terrible. And then 20 <laughs> minutes later, he came over and said, you know, you did pretty good. It oh, totally, it, and, and I just knew then guy had a sense of humor. Yeah. Um, we'll see you compete through 2024. That's my plan. Yes. Um, cool. Definitely through 2024. And then after that, it will just be as long as I'm enjoying it, staying healthy, we'll just kind of take it year by year. Um, I always knew that I wanted to go through 2022 and then mm -hmm. we'd kind of see, but now that the Olympics has been postponed a year and hopefully not again, but it, having only three years until the next Olympics doesn't sound nearly as long yeah. as daunting. So that's my plan. Um, um, LA is in 2028. That's a, that's a tough one. It's going to be pushing it a little bit. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> I just, I know that I will want to have a family someday and mm -hmm. I am not one of those people that will want to be pole vaulting while I have kids. Okay. I, once, cool. once I start a family, I'll want to put all my time and energy into that. Pole vaulting is stressful enough for me. Sure. So like trying to like take care of kids and pole vault just seems just my head would explode. There's, I, just don't see that going well. <laughs> Do you see, it seems to me like uh, Fanny Blackers Cohn, she was a 1948 multiple gold medalist and she had two kids near the end of World War II. And she, I mean, she got just people sent her hate letters and stuff, you know, and, and, and th they don't talk about it now. And women having kids and then competing do you see a different standard for women as opposed to men in terms of athletic competition? Um, maybe not a different standard. You, you mean in terms of having, having kids and still competing? Yeah. Um, I think, no, I think now it's when women come back after having kids, it's, it's praised. It's like, yeah. yes, you go. That is awesome. Um, yeah. And I have so much respect for the people that do it because I, I already know how hard it would be. And that's why I'm sure. like, I, could, I don't think I can handle that. Um, I just know how easily stressed that I get. And I wouldn't want to take that out on my kids in any way. Um, there was uh, there's a story of Joan Benoit Samuelson, the Olympic gold medalist in 1984. So Joan, I, I knew her and her husband pretty well. And she was coaching in college and she quit coaching. And I asked her what the deal was. And she said, um, athletes got to be selfish. She goes, I need to be selfish the next year. Um, one of the things, and selfish is really the wrong word, I think. I think there's a self-awareness and a focus that you have to have to be at your level. Um, yeah. So Brad, is Brad your coach or is he a mentor? Where do you see that too? I'm fascinated with how athletes have coaches and then they also have coaches and mentors. How do you describe that relationship? Both. Okay. Um, I, he's, I mean, he's absolutely my coach. Like, yeah. uh, yep. And, but he has obviously taught me a lot in the pole vault, but also in doing that has made me such a confident person outside of the sport. I was mm -hmm. somebody that was always very, I don't want to say worried about what people thought, but I was always very conscious of that. Never wanted to ruffle feathers. I'm just not a confrontational person. Sure. And I remember one time he, he said to me, this was going into the 2018 season. He's like, <laughs> kind of saying you're too nice and you need to start beating these girls, not caring what they think. And I, I always remember when I would compete with say Mary Saxer, for example, we were such good. Sure. Friends. If she beat me, it was like, okay, it's okay. Like she's better. She was better than me. Like it kind of made sense. And I love her. Yeah. And he's like, you need to start beating these girls and not caring what they think. Yeah. And and not, and I I care too. I like I'm I'm never gonna go out of my way to, to be mean or rubber sure. 
anything like that. But it was just kind of a good life lesson of, you know, you need to kind of take oh, over. Yeah. You need to uh, not care so that you can achieve this level that I know you're capable of. And then in day-to-day life, it that that confidence carries over. And I now just feel very confident in who I am and cool. I have a phenomenal support system, which helps immensely. But um, I... I worry a lot less about those sorts of things now. Where are you based out of? We are training uh, near Atlanta, Georgia. Okay, okay. Now, is that where you were raised? No, I'm from Ohio. Really? Where in Ohio? Cleveland area. Okay, cool, cool. No okay. Yeah, all right. <laughs> um, the um, the nature of track and field is such that it's um, – when you're at a big championship, it's considered a team event, but it still comes down to your performance. Yes. Um, when you go to a major event and you're not pole vaulting, are there events that you like to watch? Most of them. I really, that's especially when it's a world or, you know, a t- more team mm-hmm. oriented event. Um, but even nationals um u.s nationals i love watching the day before we compete i really love watching the men's pole vault i mean that yeah. makes sense right but sure. um and i've always said i love the the mid-distance races i think they are so much fun because they're they are short enough where you, you know you don't lose focus but also there's some strategy like they're fast but they're strategy and so mm-hmm. watching the change of like the lead and everything super fun um yeah i i i just love track and field so cool. it's really cool. fun to watch well we've got a world championships coming in the u.s in 2022 yes. uh and it's the first outdoor one we've had one in indianapolis and had one up i think in canada um how does that how does that affect you what are you thinking about with eugene coming up I mean, absolutely. That's a huge team you want to make. You want to represent your country at Mm -hmm. the world championships in your home country. That's a lot of athletes do not have that opportunity. So I always knew I was going through 2022, if nothing else. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we'd play it by ear. But now with things getting postponed, it just makes sense to go through 2024 as well. Um, But yeah, just keep training and do what I can to make that make that team. For sure. In in 2020, it was kind of an unusual year, yes. and I know that for sprinters and for distance runners, they had a certain number of competitions they had to do mm-hmm. to keep sponsors happy. And a, there was a couple of sprinting events where guys did like six or seven events, and I get phone calls from sponsors going, "Ah, uh, that's not going to fly." Um, did you have a certain number of competitions that you had to do in 2020? Yes. Yeah, I yeah, did. Okay, and I okay. understand that it's, you know, and in a normal year, like that makes sense and companies kind of have to do what they need to do. Sure. They were affected as well. So yeah, I, yeah. I understood keeping that, um, as a, as a requirement. Um, luckily those Atlanta track league, or I'm sorry, the American track league meets held in Atlanta. I was able to knock a lot of those out. My cool. first, my two meets indoors counted, I was able to do a lot of those. And then I was, I got to do a little bit of sprinting too, which I haven't done since oh my gosh. college. So that was really fun to run the 100. I hadn't done that. What did you think about that? I was so excited. I've always wanted to break 12 seconds in the 100 and I've been close. And so uh-huh. running sub 12 was like. Awesome. So fun. <laughs> That's cool. So would you, do a two, would you do a 200 or not? No. <laughs> I, maybe if I had to, but no, I, that's, that's practically endurance for me. So yeah. well, I, I know the, <laughs> we don't the train old... speed long enough yeah, and yeah. I could see myself locking up in a 200, which is kind of embarrassing, but <laughs> you have, there's a little bit of training that goes into a 200. <laughs> Would you do another ultimate garden clash? If it was televised and all that yes for just practice sake absolutely not that was so hard um 
And it was one of those things that I'll be happy just doing once in my life. But if they make it a big production again, yes, I would, I would do it again. <laughs> it made the sport alive, you know, and we, you know, yeah. people, track fans really wanted to see something. And what was cool was watching you on streaming, but also I was checking Facebook and seeing people just going crazy seeing it, you know, and yeah. all the notes. And, and a lot of the notes came from young kids who I hadn't seen on track stuff before. So you're attracting a younger audience too, which makes everybody happy. It was um, such a good idea. It was, it was really brilliant. And I'm just so happy that they came up with that. And I'm really honored that they picked me to be part of it because there are several other candidates that could have been in there. So I'm really glad I did get to be a part of it. All right. I'm going to give you five athletes names. You're allowed three words to describe them. Okay. All right. Oh boy. I hope I know all of them. <laughs> uh, it'll be, it'll be in the pole vault. <laughs> um, okay. And it'll be athletes. I think that you've competed against um, Jen Shore. Um, tough. Okay. Um, consistent and fearless though. I would, I've always heard stories of her just back in the day. There's a headwind people wanted to change the direction. And she said, no, we warmed up this way. We're going this way. And she, wow. she would just crush it. So, yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, Sandy Morris. Oh, fun. Um, sweetheart. Nice as can be. Um, and just competitive as I'll get out. Like when she's in there, you know, they're like, you got to bring your A game to beat her. So, uh, I'm Lisa Newman. Alicia, um, talented, clutch, like third attempt, like sh I, there, she's really clutch at those third attempt big makes, mm -hmm. um, and just athletic. She's a very athletic person. Sorry, someone decided I like to call me during time. Um, uh, Aznalika Sinarova. Um, consistent. She always looks great. Um, I don't know how to put this into one word, but she okay. takes off at like 12, 13 feet. Her takeoff is so much farther out than the rest of us. It's just so, her jump is like technician, I guess would be. Okay. Okay. Like just a technician. And I'm, I, mm, I would say, like nice. She's quiet, but she's always been so nice. Like every time I've talked to her. So I don't know her as well as the other vaulters personally, but she's always been so nice. Uh, Stacy Dragila. Trailblazer uh, for one. Have you got um, to talk to her? Yes. Okay. Okay, she's cool. So cool. Yeah, I got, I got to see her on all our big jumps. So uh, I, I didn't really watch her career admittedly when she mm -hmm. was competing. So as a jumper, I feel like I don't, know her super well but in meeting her she just i i don't know if i'm allowed to swear but she's just badass like cool. um, that's, there, that's great <laughs> she there's a story of her i i'm pretty sure it's her where she did just some like ba like kind of basic navy seal type training stuff yeah and just excelled at it she's oh just, no she she's like she's a heptathlete she's one of the toughest athletes i have ever seen she's incredible yeah. um and just cool. She's just a cool person. You just really enjoy your time talking with her. Well, you've survived 30 and a half minutes and I enjoy talking with you, Katie. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> this great. is really a lot of fun. I've been wanting to do this for a year. I, um, I'm glad you reached out. And we look forward to seeing you compete this weekend. Stay safe. Um, and, and I'm glad you're healthy again. Um, and uh, this is Larry Eater with, with Socialing the Distance. And we featured Katie Nagiot. And she is the Nike sponsored pole vaulter. Uh, PBs of 491 indoors, 492 outdoors, and those are going to both get higher. I, I see a vision of over five meters on both. So, um, but great to talk with you. Stay safe. And uh, Katie, thank you again. Thanks for your time today. Thank you. Hey, sports fans, Larry Eater. Uh, this is Run Blog Run, and we're socialing the distance. And we just spoke with Katie uh, Najat. See, I pronounced your name right, Katie. This is the epilogue where I'm supposed to like wax poetically. Uh, I've been wanting to interview Katie for about a year. Um, 
and actually probably since 2018 when I watched her have that masterful um, evening in Albuquerque where she set uh, she won her first national championship going uh, 491, which is 16 feet, just over one inch. Okay, um, she has a PB outdoors of 492, 16 feet, I think one and three quarters. Uh, she's coached by Brad Walker, who was the uh, world champion in 2007, silver medalist in 2005. He won um, in Moscow in the world indoors. Uh, I think he was at 604. Um, and I'm pretty sure he was one of the first two Americans over six meters. But I did a poster, Brad, back in the old days uh, for Nike. Cap, uh, John Capriati got me to do that. And I uh, always liked Brad. So it's nice to see Brad coaching uh, Katie. Um, I asked uh, Katie if, if uh, Brad is coach or mentor, and she said definitely coach. Um, Katie is a competitor, um, like all um, women pole vaulters. Um, she, but she's been doing it since she was 13. Um, got into it really late high school, uh, college, uh, Division II NCAA champion, University of Dayton. Uh, went to Ashland before that. Um, and uh, since uh, 2018, really, has been a global player. And um, uh, she got over COVID. She had COVID in December. Uh, and we're glad she's feeling better. Uh, she was originally planning to go to Europe. But as she said, um, going from one border control to another and them seeing you're an American, first of all, which is crap right now. And then two, uh, that you had COVID. Yeah, she'd be sitting in some hotel in France. And, you know, the food's good. Uh, French TV is pretty good. They, you know, they subtitle all, you know, Fresh Prince of Bel Air and all that stuff. And uh, the novellas are pretty good, too. But. Yeah, if you can't pole vault for two weeks, you kind of lose your mind. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, the uh, Olympics being postponed. She's still hoping that it happens this year. Um, I asked her about competing, um, when she'll compete. She said definitely 2024. Uh, and she really wants to compete in Eugene and the world champs in Eugene. First time outdoors in uh, for world champs in the U.S. And we're pretty excited about it, too. Um, but 2028? That remains to be seen. Um, she has said that at this time, there'll be a time when she wants to have kids, and uh, she's not sure she wants to juggle kids and being an elite athlete. I can understand that. I think those are a lot of pressures. And I think that at this time, women have the ability to choose whether they want to be an elite athlete after kids or whether they don't, you know? Um, and I think that's actually kind of cool. Um, we talked about some uh, some of her competitors, uh, Jen Shore, uh, Sandy Morris, um, uh, Alicia Newman, um, Anzalika Sidorova, uh, Stacey Dugila, uh, probably the the real champion of the pole vault. Uh, and uh, it was fun. But uh, all in all, uh, Katie shows herself as an athlete who is possessed of confidence, a lot of talent, works really, really hard. And we cannot wait to see her compete in non-pandemic times. And we hope that she stays safe. Um, but it was a fun interview. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks to Mike Deering, who produced it for us. And um, at the end of the day, if you like Run, Blog, Run, support us and tell your friends. And the way to support us is to like us on Facebook, Inst Instagram, and um, Twitter. And if you love us, subscribe on YouTube. Last year, uh, Michael produced 393 different videos for us. There's a lot of Larry talking out there and a lot of athletes being interviewed, and we hope that you enjoy it. But we try to cover a plethora of topics because guess what? We're track geeks, and we know that you are too. And it's one of the few things we can do in the pandemic and, you know, without having to wash our hands or wear a mask. So, you know, uh, have fun. Uh, have a beverage. Uh, I'm on a whole 30 diet right now. So uh, have a glass of wine for me and eat a high caloric, high carbohydrate dessert. Okay. After your run and then enjoy some of our stuff. But uh, Larry Eater signing off. Have a great evening. Talk to you soon.